Hello, everybody, and welcome back from lunch. I hope you had a chance to grab a good uh, sandwich, I think there were. Uh, <laughs> I didn't eat that much, you can tell. Um, I'm Aidan Pepin. I'm a tech and policy researcher, and I'm part of the team of Milltown Partners, and I won't go off script again, I promise. Um, Here's a reminder that today in room Bronte B, we have an experiential art performance by Cybot, which is an AI uh, that draws your portrait in real time. If you didn't see it at lunchtime, do check it out in the afternoon break later on. Now, our next session dives into AI and biology. In a rapidly evolving world, the intersection of biotechnology and AI presents both unparalleled opportunities and heightened risks. We'll discuss technological advancements needed in biosecurity, the intertwined challenges with AI, and the potential for growth through international collaboration between governments. To set the scene for us, we'll start this session with a talk from Anna Marie Wagner, head of AI and SVP corporate development at Ginkgo Bioworks. Anna Marie has previously been an investor at Bain Capital Private Equity and a Baker Scholar at Harvard Business School. She'll do her talk and then she'll host a panel of experts. Please join me in welcoming Anna Marie Wagner to the stage. Thank you all so much for coming. Make sure this works. All right. Um, this is me when I was five or six or so. Um, and ever since I was about this age, I wanted to be a biochemical engineer. I was very fortunate to have supportive parents, even when I brought a microscope to the dinner table to look at some horrible concoction that my mother had made. And even when I grew Petri dishes in the uh, shoe rack of my closet in high school. When I got to Harvard, I had a taste of what it actually meant to be a biological engineer. And after about a year and a half of that, I gave up, and I switched to a much easier subject, which was math. The reality is that biology is bloody hard. You are programming in machine code, A, C, T, 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 G, 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 A, 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 et cetera. You have no idea how that code is compiled into some function that you're actually trying to generate. And by the way, after you have written all that code and you think it works, it just randomly gets bugs in it, and you have no idea why, you have no idea where. If you run exactly the same experiment two days in a row, you will very likely get very different results, and you will have no idea why. In addition to all of that, the actual process of programming biology is a manual process that you do by hand. Some people in this audience may have used punch cards. The rest of you have heard about punch cards. It's like that, but all the punch cards are different sizes. They're clear. They have to be kept at very specific temperatures. They have to be timed correctly. And if you screw any one of those processes up, your code is not going to work. And by the way, when you make a mistake, which you will, you're not going to know where. It's a stochastic error. But it's also magic. It is the only technology I'm aware of that is capable of both this kind of nanoscale precision. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But that can also cover our globe, feed us keep us alive. I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of what biology can do. This is one of my favorite proteins. It's an enzyme called ATP synthase. In secondary school, most of you probably learned about this, but you probably also promptly forgot about it because it was presented to you like a you know, chemical formula. Effectively, that was my phone. Um, this is effectively, though, the protein that powers your cells. That is a 21,000 RPM rotary motor in your cells that is fueling the energy. Just to compare that, a 737 jet engine maxes out around 15,000 RPM. And it does all of that in a diameter of about 10 nanometers. Again, I'll compare that to the semiconductor industry. Many of you probably follow this industry. The bleeding edge technology right now is IBM's two nanometer chip. Those of you who follow the industry really closely also know that two nanometers is a completely meaningless number that has nothing to do with size. And so this molecular machine that spins at 21,000 revolutions per minute at, is a fraction of the size of our most cutting edge semiconductor transistors today. And that code, or that, that protein, is programmed in digital code in the form of A, C, T, and G. It self-assembles that hugely complex molecule from code. Another way to think about it is it's another language, right? In human language, we have, in English at least, we have 26 letters. Those combine to make about 200,000 words. You can combine those words into sentences that convey the multitudes of human thought. In biology, we have four nucleotides, or letters, in DNA. 
Those are combined into 64 three-letter words, which we call codons. And those codons tell the cells which amino acids to bring together to form these proteins. And those proteins are what make up the diversity of life. They make up collagen, which is the most prevalent protein in our bodies. It makes up your skin, as an example. Insulin, the protein that regulates your blood sugar. Hemoglobin, the protein that gets oxygen around your body. All of that runs from these four letters that make up those 64 words that make up these proteins. But there's one big difference. We invented human language. We know the rules, we know the syntax, we know the grammar. And through some sort of miracle of efforts like Google Books and attention capitalism and our own egos telling us to post our every opinion on the internet, there is a massive repository of labeled training data that is accessible to cutting edge AI models that can start learning from what humans have created over centuries and, and millennia. Biology, on the other hand, invented us. You might recognize that in the therapeutics world, we call it drug discovery and not drug engineering. Most of the medicines that we rely on, we have just gotten lucky and discovered because 3.7 billion years of code has been written for us by Mother Nature, right? We all learned about it in school. The bread got moldy, and now we have penicillin, quinine, morphine, aspirin, all of those come from plants. Indigenous peoples have been using those for thousands of years before chemists isolated the specific compounds that were responsible for those seemingly magical qualities of biology. Even today, antibiotic discovery largely comes from soil microbiomes, because all those little bacteria and fungi are trying to fight each other so that they get prime real estate. In the process, that code is being written that is inventing new biology that we are benefiting from. So we're really just scratching the surface and understanding what code is out there and what it does. Um, and there is a huge amount of data that is theoretically available to us, right? 3.7 billion years of code has been written. We are getting better at being able to read that code, right? We have next-gen sequencing. We're able to see the code, although, again, still scratching the surface. But if I gave even a really good scientist a random piece of DNA they'd never seen before, they would have a really hard time telling me anything useful about what it did. What we're really missing is that translation from sequence to function, or even from structure to function. And that's the type of work that, that Ginkgo is, is really working on. Um, I'm the head of AI for Ginkgo, um, and yet I am just as excited about the potential to create and learn from biology and learn from the data that already exists as I am about the potential for the tools of AI to help us interpret that data. What's really missing right now is the link between those two in the biological realm. The good news is that we are at the intersection of many exponentially improving technologies. Um, this chart shows the cost for DNA synthesis and DNA sequencing, in other words, the ability to read and write genetic code. Both of those are improving faster than Moore's law. Um, at Ginkgo, we operate as a horizontal platform, sort of, you can think about it a little bit like AWS or Google Cloud, but for biology, investing in the fixed infrastructure that solves some of those problems that caused me to drop out of biology. In other words, having to do a whole bunch of moving clear liquids around by hand and making stochastic human errors, taking that out of the system, driving miniaturization in these processes so that we can drive the cost down and we can make it easier for scientists to learn about that interface between sequence and function. The result of our business model and the type of work that we do is that we've worked on hundreds of programs and in that process have amassed very, very, very large data sets, both in terms of just what has Mother Nature created for us before. This is an example of our proprietary uh, protein database, so protein sequence database, but also in service of trying to make that biology better for our customers, engineering these proteins to be more functional for our customers. We've taken tens of millions of measurements of this particular protein in that particular setting did what? And importantly, we care just as much about the experiments that fail as the experiments that succeed. If you think about how the pharmaceutical industry has operated to date, the only things that get studied deeply are the drugs that work. We think that's a huge mistake. You're throwing away 99.9% .9 of the data that you have, the, the potential for learning that you have. And we've always approached this 
very differently and, and benefit now from having this very large labeled data set. We're now using that data to train foundation models for biology. So GPT-4 is a foundation model for human language. It understands how human language works because it's seen a lot of human language. We want to create models that understand what makes a protein a protein. What does proteinness even mean? And then layer that with the kind of labeled data that helps you connect proteinness to the function of that protein so that we can do work for our customers that make it much easier to de novo generate new biology that solves their core problems. This is a little nerdy, so bear with me. But one thing that's important to remember about biology is that the tools that we use to engineer biology are fundamentally biological tools. And so as we get better at engineering biology, we can point that capability at the tools that are used to engineer biology themselves. And so, yes, we sit at the intersection of these exponential curves, but those exponential curves also have a multiplicative relationship with one another that improves even faster because you can make the tools themselves better, whether it's gene editing enzymes or DNA repair enzymes or the like. All right. It can be really hard to think about what the future looks like when you're on the vertical part of an exponential curve. So I get asked a lot, what are you most excited about five years from now, 10 years from now? And the reality of it is that it feels a lot more like science fiction right now than reality. But we know that biology is capable of all of these things. You, you can just look outside and you can see what biology is capable of. And so I would invite you, just for a moment, to think a little bit about what it would mean in the world if you could actually program biology the way that you program a computer. What if every medicine you took, instead of being something that we discovered from a microbe in the ground somewhere and we hope you're not allergic to, was custom built for you, for your goals, for your genetics, for your lifestyle and your circumstances? What if when you wanted to build a house, instead of buying materials from around the world and putting them up on your plot of land, you sat down at a computer, you designed what you wanted, and that got genetically coded into a seed that you could plant on your plot of land, and for the cost of sunlight and water, your house would grow. By the way, if you want to remodel it, you just inject some new code. The agriculture industry today is a biological industry. We would think that it's already biological. I don't think people appreciate that about 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption goes to the production of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that we dump on our crops in order to produce food for a growing world. Most of that nitrogen flows out of the crop into our rivers, into our lakes. What if instead of doing that, we could just engineer better biology in the soil, in the plant, to help those plants grow more effectively, to help them be resistant to drought, to help them be resistant to disease, to help make our food supply more resilient. That, by the way, is not science fiction. We are actually working on that problem with Bayer Crop Sciences right now. I genuinely believe that biology will be the most important technology to solving the world's global problems, and we have to be investing in it. There's a flip side to that. We are made of biology, and therefore biology is also the thing to which we are most vulnerable and susceptible. We are all well aware that a biological threat shut down the global economy for a couple years, killed millions of people. We have epidemics around the world happening all the, all the time. And it's not just our public health, it's our food security as well. I'm standing in the UK, you're very familiar with this, right? The UK meat industry got shut down because of a biological threat. With the development of AI tools, there's particular concern right now about what it means to be able to engineer biology, what it means to make biology easier to engineer and use these AI tools to do it. Reports about chatbots being able to plan bioweapon attacks, being able to design nerve agents. But the thing that I would highlight for you is, right now, these large language models are reading human language. It's just regurgitating things we already know. It's making it easier to find. It's making connections maybe that would take the average person a little longer to make. But that information is out there. The ship sailed. We have the opportunity to make a different choice in biology. And it's important that we start thinking about that 
because remember, humans didn't invent biology. We did invent computer program. We did invent human language. AI is going to be better than humans at biology very, very, very quickly, if not already. And so we have to think very carefully about how these tools are used and how we govern the, the data, the insights from these tools responsibly. Many people, when they hear about these risks and, they threat, and these threats, they call for a moratorium. I think that is horrifically short-sighted, if not unethical. Biology will get easier to engineer regardless of where it happens. And, and remember, there is a master programmer called Mother Nature out there throwing new biology at us all the time. And so we have to be developing the biosecurity solutions that allow us to take advantage of all of the benefits that I highlighted earlier, but also help us mitigate the risks that biology fundamentally poses. And we believe that biosecurity is what allows us to maintain that unstable equilibrium. We did this well in computer science. As programming developed, we invested in cybersecurity tools. That is now a $150 billion a year industry. We do not yet have a biosecurity industry. And by the way, the biology is already happening. We shouldn't be waiting to be good at bioengineering, to be good at synthetic biology, to build a biosecurity system. We have already lived through pandem multiple pandemics and epidemics. We have to be making these commensurate investments in biosecurity. Importantly, that has multiple aspects. You have to secure the platforms, and that's what most people focus on. You know, I think we've learned a lot from the tech industry and the fact that tech platform business models really tried to abdicate responsibility for their platforms. We're just the pipes, we're not responsible for what goes through it. Ginkgo always took a very different approach to that. We're dealing with biology. We can't let people misuse our platform. We have to start talking to the industry about how you build better tools to ensure that your platform is used responsibly. But we've recognized for a long time that securing our platform is not enough. Again, the biology is already out there. We need to be building a bio radar around the world to alert us when there's scary biology out there that we should be paying attention to. We have radar for weather. We know if it's raining outside, we can bring an umbrella. Why don't we have equivalent technology and infrastructure for biology? If we have that kind of infrastructure, then we can start investing in the types of intelligence that we need around that. You need to be able to answer a few questions when you see a new piece of DNA. What is it? By the way, should I be worried about it? If I should be worried about, about it, what do I do? Can I make a vaccine against this? Can I develop an effective therapy for this? And importantly, where did it come from? Is this bad luck? Is this an accident? Is this an act of war? These are questions that are critically important to be able to answer for national security and for public health. And we're working on projects in all of, around all of these questions. When you have that kind of radar and that kind of intelligence system, then you can actually respond effectively. You can design better public health measures. You can design proactive vaccines that are actually looking ahead. You can tamp down on emerging threats before they become epidemics or, God forbid, pandemics. And that's the work that we're doing now in biosecurity and we think needs to, needs to significantly grow in order to take advantage of all of these opportunities. Um, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a bioengineer. I wasn't good enough. Um, but now I'm incredibly privileged to be in a position where I can help many, many thousands of bioengineers actually do the kind of work that I was only able to dream of. I hope we're able to build the infrastructure to do that. And I'm excited to welcome a panel up to join me to have a deeper conversation about this now.